So good evening, everyone. It is such a pleasure to speak with you all tonight. I am Samantha Morejon, the Science and Policy Project Manager at Miami Waterkeeper. And today I'll be speaking to you all about a, collabor a collaborative report done by Miami Waterkeeper and Everglades Law Center focused on stormwater permit compliance in Miami-Dade County. So you can see in our title, it's the good, the bad, and the dirty, an audit of stormwater compliance. So for those of you who are, have not heard of Miami Waterkeeper, we work for swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water for all. Our work focuses on clean water, ecosystem protection, and sea level rise in Biscayne Bay and its waterways. We always begin our work with a strong foundation rooted in science. From there, we develop policy goals and then conduct a strategic outreach, education, and advocacy plan to achieve these goals. These approaches further our work to address pollution, climate change, and sea level rise. So as I mentioned, we are here to discuss stormwater. When it rains, pollutants in our streets, such as oil, litter, and fertilizer, wash into our storm drains and float directly into our waterways in Biscayne Bay. Often, and unfortunately, this water is untreated. This can contaminate our drinking water, make our beaches unsafe for swimming, and kill fish and other marine life. Because of stormwater's potential to carry pollution, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, or FDEP, manages stormwater pollution in the state. This means that counties and municipalities are required to have a permit called the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System, also called the MS4 permit, to discharge stormwater into waterways. So in this image right here, this is a stormwater outfall in Coconut Grove, and you have a buildup of pollutants here and stormwater going out into the bay from right there. These permits are based on population and this report focuses on the large MS4 permit for populations of 100,000 or more called the phase one permit. Three of these permits exist in Miami-Dade County, including the city of Miami, city of Hialeah and Miami-Dade County. The counties is a little different because it includes 32 co-permittees made up of municipalities. <laughs> and as I mentioned, we're trying to see whether or not they're complying with the permit itself. And the steps that we took to determine if permit holders are complying was no small feat in our team. It definitely took lots of time for us. Um, initially, we created a rubric that focused on 20 key requirements for stormwater management. You and did that? You, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. You did that yourself? Not myself. Definitely our team. No, I mean, your group, your group. Yes. That wasn't that wasn't drafted by the state or... or uh any other regulatory agency, you guys did that. We created this rubric of compliance, but it's based on the permit that FDEP has with the county and other phase one permit holders in Miami-Dade County. Okay, thank you. No I problem. I won't interrupt anymore. No worries, Herman, I appreciate it. Um, so hmm. we created a rubric with 20 key MS4 permit items, but it should be noted that these items are not entirely what's required in the permit. It's just 20 key items that we thought should always be complied with. We then submitted records requests to each MS4 permit holder. Permittees were evaluated based on the self-reported data and research from the state's database. The reason why it was based on self-reported data is that we might have prior knowledge about one municipality having something, but not prior knowledge of another. And if they didn't submit it to us, then we can't really have them on the same playing field. So to keep everything fair, everything was self-reported. We then had four individuals independently evaluate all 35 permittee annual reports. And then the four evaluators then discussed any differences in grading, finalized grades and issued recommendations from there on. As we were grading, we found it difficult to grade only on the letter of the permit without taking into account the spirit of the permit. A number of municipalities were following the bare minimum of requirements, while others were going above and beyond to ensure best management practices were taken to address the quality of stormwater discharge. <laughs> As a result, the municipalities were evaluated based on two rubrics, the first being binary compliance, where we were interested in learning if the permit requirements were met, met basic yes or no, one or zero in terms of points. So for example, did they have a street sweeping program? If they did, they would get one point. If they do not, they get zero points. The other rubric being a qualitative weighted scale of compliance where they would get fewer or more points based on their activities. So in the same example of street sweeping, a permittee that performed it once a year would receive fewer points than another who did it once a month. So this is 
the rubric that we graded on. And let me find street sweeping over here. Yes or no in terms of compliance, whether or not they were doing it. Whereas if they're doing it annually, they would receive one point. Whereas if they're doing it monthly, they would receive three points. We then have our results. So based on binary compliance, not a single permittee was 100% compliance with the MS4 permit. Miami-Dade County received a B minus, but when graded alongside its co-permittees, this grade drops to a C minus. The city of Miami received a grade of a C plus and the city of Hialeah a C. There's a broad range in compliance though. We can see that the highest being Key Biscayne and Doral with 95%, whereas Opalaka gets 44%, and Virginia Gardens right above that with 47. Some highlights about this rubric is that 45% of permittees did not have a written stormwater management program. I personally could imagine that it's quite difficult for municipality to plan and manage their stormwater without a written plan or process set in place. Additionally, 43% of permittees did not provide a complete map of their stormwater system. Again, how can you manage maintenance or inspection schedules if you don't know where all of your stormwater system parts are? 54% of permittees did not perform the required personnel training for illicit discharge or spill response, and 34% of permittees did not perform proactive inspections of illicit discharges. Wow. wow. Definitely. And then on the qualitative scots, on the qualitative rubric, where we're looking at the spirit of the permit going above and beyond doing more than the bare minimum, we noticed that permittees received a lower grade, showing that although they were complying with the letter of the permit, they're not following through with its spirit. Miami-Dade County received a B minus again, but when graded with its co-permittees, this grade drops to a D. The city of Miami received a grade of B plus, and the city of Hialeah received a grade of a D minus. There's a broad range of compliance again with this rubric grading from 37% to 93%. We then have some highlights of the stormwater management plans that we received. They range from 1999 to 2021. This is cause for concern, seeing that from 1999 to present day, I'm sure that there are lots of changes in your infrastructure, in your processes, in your municipality itself. So it is important to make sure that you're updating your stormwater management plans as a municipality or a permittee. 38% of the permittees did not provide all of the required attachments to their annual reports. In this past year three report, the one that was that we graded of year 2020, they were required to have things like water quality monitoring data and evaluations of that, but many of them did not. Um, additionally, 94% of the permittees did not suggest iterative improvement or changes in their annual report. It's always important to look back and reflect and see how you can do better seeing that the state of our bay is in crisis. So 94% did not take that time to reflect. And only 29% of permittees inspected the required amount of stormwater structures. Just to add, with these results being said, it should be pointed out that Miami-Dade has a wide range of capability and size amongst its municipalities. Some areas are fully resourced and staffed with large budgets, whereas others are very small communities operating with very minimal personnel. There's also a wide disparity in finances and communities of color. And these are all things to compare when you're looking at that. So it's not fair to say that one municipality cares about their stormwater less, they might not have the resources to do so. Um, after forming these results, we developed a list of recommendations to the county as they gear up to renew their MS4 permit with the state. This would include things like updating their stormwater management plans more frequently, such as five years, having accurate and digitized stormwater system maps, implementing a system to support them in managing their stormwater system. Um, here it's noted as a SAMS. And having the county take a leading role, not only in complying with the permit, but supporting its co-permittees and being compliant as well. Now, we did develop a list of recommendations for municipalities and permit holders but there are a lot of steps that an individual can take as well. The goal here is to minimize pollutants that could run off from your property and into Biscayne Bay. Some ways to do that are to not fertilize during the rainy season and follow the best management practices noticed in the county's fertilizer ordinance during the dry season, properly disposing of long clippings and debris in a compost bin or even leaving them in place as a natural form of fertilizer, 
Um, when placed in storm drains, they can contribute to nutrient pollution or eutrophication, which is just contributing to the problem. <laughs> And um, other steps like washing your car in the grass to allow your lawn to filter the water before it goes into a stormwater system or washing it at car wash is fine as well. They also have stormwater systems in place. Lastly, other ways that members can help us monitor Biscayne Bay is by taking our 1000 Eyes on the Water program. I'm sure as anglers, you all see many things on a daily basis when you're out on the water. I'm sure you've seen sediment plumes, distressed wildlife, oil sheens, <coughs> Excuse me. And um, by taking our 1000 Eyes in the Water program, you would be able to see what we're looking for and how to send that over to us. When pollution reports are sent to us, we then triage them, send, send them to the correct agencies in a timely manner. And we tend to have a pretty high success rate with that. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have one. What's up? Well, uh, first, I like the acronym. The, the talk was excellent. SWAMP, the, the SWMP, that's a really good acronym. But the, the serious question is, um, okay, there's all these frag this fragmentation of the stormwater. Isn't there one agency, if not the, the, part, the State Department, something that can look at the bay as a whole and, and get it under control? It's just, it's never going to work if we use all these little, little uh, municipalities and uh, the people that work with the county. How, what do you see as a solution for this? David, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, <laughs> looking at the Bay holistically is, is not easy because we don't we haven't done a study as far as I know, kind of pointing to all these different points of non-point sources and saying this percent of it is coming from fertilizer, this percent is coming from stormwater and so on, um, which makes it rather difficult. Now, I do understand that point of a stormwater permit is to address discharge. So, so if you have water discharging off your streets, you want to make sure that it's slowed down to get to filter it over time. But at the same time, it's so much pollution going on. We have fertilizer, septic waste that's leaking into the bay. We have sewage leaks. Just a couple weeks ago when we had that big storm, there were SSOs all over the place. And it's, it's a lot to, to take in. We can't just blame it on stormwater either. Uh, uh, let me ask you a question then. <clears throat> um, uh, you asked them for information. They did their self, they, they supplied the information themselves. Um, but um, you have you camera, now yeah. closed the loop and gone back to them with the, with the <laughs> report? Yes, we did send all of them the report and we have had meetings with several of the municipalities to see how they can make improvements. Uh -huh. And as well as meeting with the county about ways that they can make improvements in their have, permit. Have they been cooperative? Have they been open to the feedback? They have been actually, they've been very open to the feedback and a, a pretty big win that we that were considering is that the county has a Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board. It's uh -huh. a long acronym. <laughs> um, but they just reviewed many of our recommendations and implemented them into a piece of legislation that they're going to send over to the Board of County Commissioners and hopefully pass. So we're hoping that many of our recommendations get put into the next permit cycle, which this cycle is about to end now in June, and they're reapplying for a new permit. So it, it is getting better, we're hoping. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Then they would set the pace for the other smaller communities too, is that correct? Yes and no. The 32 co-permittees are pretty much most of the municipalities in Miami-Dade County. There are only four small MS4 permits in the county. Um, mm -hmm. Things like Florida City, Sweetwater, Biscayne Park, and I believe I'm missing one. South yeah, Miami. I was referring to the South 32. Miami. I was referring to the 32. Um, the 32 are on the same permit as the county, so we're also looking to the county to be a, more of a leader in this role. You would think that as a co-permittee, it'd be kind of like a co-signatory in a house, where if one were to default, the co-signer kind of takes responsibility. That's not exactly the case in this permit. Um, our understanding is that the county is also a co-permittee, so on the same status and level as the rest of the co-permittees. Not so much as like a leading factor, which is what we'd like. Samantha, I have some questions and some thoughts for you. Yeah, I'd love to hear them. So. Um, for folks, for folks who don't know, I'm Bill Stoddard, a biology professor at FIU. I was mayor of South Miami for 10 years, and I'm a fisherman. Um, so Samantha, a bunch, bunch of welcome. questions. Welcome to this club. Thanks, guys. 
Um, Samantha, this is the budget season. This is the time of year when all the all the staff of all the municipalities get together with their elected officials to decide the budget for the coming fiscal year. And yes. so if, if there's additional budget items to be put into the budget for compliance purposes, now is the time to do it. You mentioned some of the groups or some of the municipalities staffs are short for this sort of issue. Now is when they could put in a compliance person. So I think if you can if you can come in and sort of hit them right now, say, hey guys, it's budget season. Now is the time to be fixing X, Y, and Z in your in your deficiencies. That would be um, that would be the most effective time to make to make those requests because later on in the year they're going to get forgotten and say, oh, we don't have the budget for it. Now they have the option to put it in for October first. I totally agree, and we are developing an outreach plan to reach out to these different municipalities and try to make improvements slowly but steady. Well, catch me up with South. Catch up with me with about South Miami because South Miami did not get an A. Um, I would love to. And I work with um, I work with the Green Task Force in South Miami, which can make recommendations to the commission. So now is the time we need to be doing that. Um, second thing is, um, in terms of the terms, terms of the terms. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> Do the terms of the permit have any teeth? That is to say, is there any compliance action that can be taken? For for non compliant you know, for failure to comply, and Waterkeeper has has a distinguished history of bringing litigation where where it was deemed appropriate. We did do some research into the state's database of Oculus, and we did find that the state was trying to do some kind of enforcement, but we haven't seen any teeth with that. Uh, we've seen some cases where they would bring up cases of non compliance, but there hasn't been much follow up or, or really any enforcement on their end. Okay. Um, we did send the report to FDEP as well, though. What's your plan for outreach to the municipalities? That's going to include a toolkit geared towards municipalities and presenting our recommendations, ways that they can be supported by the county since the county. Present, presenting, presenting them where and how? Through meetings. Like at, at, their, at their council meetings or with individual meetings with, with commissioners and staff or what? With their public works departments because they work most with their stormwater systems and seeing what what they can do and what resources that they have okay um well in terms in terms of budget um the other thing to be doing right now is going back to to the electeds as well because i think you'll find that most elected officials want to do well i mean the the staff tends to tends to say oh you know they're more likely to drag their feet um some won't but many will um, this is the way we've done it, and it's worked. You're asking us to do more work, and we don't have the budget for it. Da da da. If you come in from the, from the top down as well, uh, and reach out to elected officials, and oftentimes you can identify the ones who are particularly uh, keen on environmental protection, um, mm -hmm. and you come to them and say, "Hey, it's budget season, guys. You know, here's the things your municipality's not doing that are going to take some resources. Can you, you know, twist your city manager's arm to make sure that stuff winds up in the budget? Because that's how it happens." The budget definitely, typically, definitely typically to staff, our list. staff may put in their requests and then the and then the commissioners are often looking to trim those things back if you come in at the at the level of the commission or the council um top down it works best because they are ultimately the bosses of the of the city manager mm -hmm. so that's that's how i would recommend you do it i would also go to the league of cities meeting if you want to catch everybody at once or at least every municipality at once miami league of cities everybody there you can just read off the list and say there's not a person here whose municipality couldn't be doing better and um you know i'd like to get your i'd like to get the name of your most uh, your biggest environmental champion on your on your council and i want to i want to talk to that person um and they'll know who that is if it's not that person who's the representative for the league of cities him or herself okay okay and uh, and don't don't hesitate to reach out for me for more for more assistance in cracking that nut I probably will definitely. Okay. So, so Philip, do you have students that would be willing to volunteer? You know, would would this be an opportunity for for volunteers to get involved to make observations or or help? Uh, our help our students. Department? We have a lot of students who do that already. So yeah, they're 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 on this. A lot of folks work with. Um, we've got a big uh, water chemistry group up at our north campus on Biscayne Bay. Um, Henry Henry Bersenio does a, does an amazing amount of 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 monitoring and um, um well i'm suggesting that uh maybe that would be a resource that the waterkeeper could use 
you know. Oh yeah, no, no, we're in, in, they're, a, good they're, faith, in a good faith uh, approach to the departments. No, our people, our people are in touch with Waterkeeper and vice versa. I mean, we've got we've got all kinds of monitors out. Uh, Len Sinto is an ecotoxicologist and a good water chemist, and he's he's got a big team working on it. So yeah, we we work hand in glove with Waterkeeper. Um, yeah, we work very often with FIU. I'm an FIU alum. <laughs> and and so Philip, then you're going to have to prepare a presentation for the club too in the future. <laughs> I'll be contacting you. Okay, it may it may happen yet, or or, or I'll get or I'll get one of my colleagues who's, who knows even more than I do. Well, Jennifer Jennifer Rehange, I don't know if you know her, but she's oh, yes. been it before. No, Jen's Jen's terrific. I knew her since she was since she was an undergraduate. Yeah, no, she gave us a great presentation. So you're yeah. next on the list. I'll contact you. She she talked to you about the pharmaceuticals. No, she talked to us about Snook uh, all the way from uh, the cane patch down to uh, down to Cape Sable and and, and bonefish. Uh, Yep. And bonefish too over at Garfield Bite. And, and, I was uh, going to say you got you got to get uh, Jen back in to talk about their their discovery of pharmaceuticals in the uh, in the bonefish. Bonefish. Yeah, I think she hinted at that. Yeah. All right. Especially in the summertime okay. here because it's too hot to be out fishing anyway in a lot of these. Places. So I'll put another question out to Samantha, whoever. Um, the canal system and. It's, it's not going to be going away too easily, but is that led to a lot of this issue? I mean, can we get back to filtration with estuaries and natural natural means? Is there some some projects? I think they're working on some near in the Cutler Bay area. Anything like that? Yeah, at near Deering Estate, they're working on on a project. Um, I'm sure there are natural measures and we definitely need to, but it's, there's so many pollutants going on into Biscayne Bay, at least from, from what I've seen in research that we need to first handle the pollution, which mm -hmm. can help the water quality. Mm -hmm. And that's, for example, septic to sewer is such an expensive hill to mountain to climb over that it's really difficult, especially because you see both septic to sewer and disadvantaged communities. And that's a lot of money to ask people to pay thousands of dollars. Um, when you look at our crumbling sewage infrastructure, where we have frequent sewage overflows, more things that we need to consider to, first we need to address those sources of pollution and that will help the water quality, that will help our seagrass beds, that'll help our ecosystems. It, it can't all just be done naturally because we, we need to fix what's polluting it. Yeah, big problem. Um, I'll take, um... I'll start a discussion with you on this. I mean, so the sort of the street level pollution that we see, we have a lot of issues with lawns. Um, the septic tanks is, is a separate one because everything you flush down the toilet essentially winds up in the bay. I mean, some of the nitrogen, some of the nitrates and nitrites and ammonia gets gasified by, by a properly working septic system. But after a few years, the rock below a septic tank is saturated with phosphate and every little molecule of phosphate after that winds up in Biscayne Bay. It may take six months to get there, but it all gets there. And it all fuels algae that smothers the seagrass. And you get the reverse succession from Thalassia down to the, you know, the cord grasses and down to algae and nothing else. And so that's, that's what, of course, happened up in the Northern Bay. And we're starting to see it now in the Southern Bay. Um, so... You know, so that that is obviously a big piece, but there's there's a couple pieces pieces of the story that are not getting much attention. One is ag, um, and we don't want we don't want to lose agriculture. But at the same time, when I went out to Black Point a few days ago, boy, driving down that canal on the way there, it was revolting. It was just an algal glop, and you know the residential canals are not that bad. Honestly, the 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 um, the agricultural canals are an absolute disaster and nobody wants to end agriculture, including me, but we've got to do better than we're doing. Um, and the ag, ag is exempted from the, uh, from the county's fertilizer ordinance um, and, there's, and nobody's taken on this problem. So this is huge and has to be addressed or we're gonna lose the South Biscayne Bay seagrass beds as well. And they've, had, they've, they've suffered a big loss and Carlos Menes, you know, says it's says it's doing fine, and he is dead wrong. Um, I mean, the seagrass, the seagrass is. We've got the data. Durham has the data on the west side of the bay. The seagrass has declined. Oh gosh, it's it's down to you know coverage in the twenty percent range now. The second one that nobody's looking at 
is turf. And so we're, we're not allowed to apply biosolids, which is a nice, uh, nice term for a human manure um, here in the county. But we ship, it, we ship it upstate where they use it, they apply it to turf fields, harvest the turf, including the soil, and bring it back down here and we lay it in our yards. And everything in it, all of the pharmaceuticals and all of the nutrients wash back into the limestone rock and back into the bay. And nobody's doing anything about that. Nobody's looking at it and talking about it. So there's like these two big pollution sources that are rife and there's just nobody even addressing them. Um, and, you know, including Waterkeeper. <laughs> I mean, you know, absolutely nobody's dealing with these things or talking about them. And um, I'm wondering how, how we get that one going even. Or there's, there's two going. Agri agriculture and, and, um, and sod. In the topic of agriculture, um, I definitely agree it's difficult there because agriculture really, it boosts Florida's economy. Um, we got to eat. I mean, you know, exactly. <laughs> and, and Miami-Dade County is, is going to become the biggest food producer in the state in terms of counties because we're going to maintain the most level rainfall and, and the most moderate climate just because we've got the ocean breeze protections. Not Biscayne Bay though. No, the Bay, the Bay, bay is, is not, it's not a food source. No, but the, I'll but the ag, our ag personal experience. Okay. The, the, oh, shrimp, yeah. the shrimp and the bait fish are down. And I, no, no. I believe what you're talking about the agriculture and the, I'm talking about the ag district, not the, not the, the Bay itself. Well, yeah, but I mean, all that runs into the Bay. Yes, sir. And the challenge is, is the fish and, and, and the bait fish, the bait in the bay are, are down. Well, you lose you lose 80 percent of your seagrass and that's going to happen because the, the seagrass is really the. Is, well, you know, know. We, we also have commercial shrimpers that, that uh, to completely strip the bottom yep. of the bay. Yep. It's true. But that's the shame we couldn't get those nets to pick up plastic. Besides shrimp and juvenile and everything else. A lot of the nets are made of plastic. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know. So, you know, from our perspective, uh, you know, fish used to come into the bay to feed. And they come in off the wrecks and they come in to feed and then they go back out. So the big fish are not residents in the bay. They visit. And they come in uh, to, to spawn and also to uh, feed. And since the, uh, when was the last time we had a shrimp run in, in Biscayne Bay? Does anybody remember that in January? Uh, the roller rigs, the roller rigs are destroyed in the last 80 years. You know, and, and so we got 15 shrimp boats that are grandfathered in, you know, that continue to death. roll the bottom from uh, 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 what Black Point South. And, um, you know, uh, uh, again, in terms of bait, if there's no bait, there's no crabs, no shrimp, then there's no fish coming in from the outside. So the whole fishing industry in the bay itself, you know, is, is, is uh, injured. Let's just put it that way. It's injured. Okay. And, uh, you know, they closed the, uh, they closed the uh, Aerojet Canal. They built a saltwater dam down there. That used to go to freshwater every, every wet season you'd have total fresh water in all of Card Sound and, and Barn Sound, period. The whole thing would be fresh water. And uh, so they've regulated that some, um, but uh, uh, anyway, there's no, there's no water access now between Miami and Key Largo, period. The fences are up and the stone is up and they, they close down any access at Card Sound. And yep. so it's, it's an 18 mile run out of Homestead if you wanna go down there to, to mess around. But Anyway, that's just the fishing side, you know, a, a oh. perspective from the fishing side. And I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not trying, I'm just trying to throw this into the mix. I'm not trying to yeah. override anything that anyone is saying, okay? Well, but, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the biggest, the biggest, bigger, bigger problem than the shrimpers is the loss of seagrass. And, and reason being is that, you know, without the seagrass, there's no shrimp even to hunt. Correct. So, so, you know, and the, and the seagrass is getting taken out by the, by the high phosphate. It's coming in off the land. I mean, we, our, our water the seagrass is on the left side. Out in the middle, there's nothing but sand. Nothing. 
understood. But but there, you know, we won't have seagrass even over on the side if we don't uh, if we don't get this reversed. I agree. So anyway, pardon, but I I have a question uh, for for the FIU person and the Durham person or whoever. Uh, are there any research going on on trying to find alternatives to the phosphate? Well, there's there are no alternatives to phosphate except using less of it. And, and Waterkeeper has been advocating for using less of it. One of the other problems that we have here is that the county ordinance requires use of, of zero phosphate fertilizers, but you cannot buy them in Miami-Dade County. Um, you go down to any of the ag stores and ask for I mean, such fertilizers exist, and they say, we don't stock this. That would have to be a special order. Well, you know, if someone needs a bag of fertilizer today, not a special order for two months from now. Um, they, all, they also have weed killer in them too, don't they? Mm -hmm. They sell for, for residential use? Um, weed and feed? Yeah, but, but even the ag fertilizers, you cannot buy zero phosphate ag fertilizers. And many of our soils have plenty of phosphate. They're not phosphate poor soils. Uh, you need a little bit of phosphate to grow sweet corn. Um, but for a lot of the stuff they grow here, you don't need to add phosphate. So, but they're adding it because you can't buy fertilizer without it. Uh, so this is, you know, you know, the county needs to, to help facilitate, you know, this rule and, and people need to, the uh, you know pestering Home Depot and Lowe's and so forth, as well as the ag fertilizer companies, you know, to provide zero phosphate fertilizers or low phosphate fertilizers. Um, so you don't. There's no substitute for phosphate in growing things, but we don't need to be applying nearly as much of it as we do. That that sounds like an easy win. Yeah, that's doable. Something that uh, Miami Waterkeeper did take part in, uh, still currently part in, we received EPA funding along with FIU and Tiffany Trockshire's lab and UM CMIS and, and I believe Beta Analytica lab to source track bacteria and nutrients in Biscayne Bay. So we sampled 12 sites in Central Bay and 10 sites in North Bay. We just finished sampling, I believe, two weeks ago. There was a lot of sampling for about a year or so. Um, and so through these samples, we're going to do microbial source tracking and nutrient sampling to determine their sources, to see if it's ag, if it's golf courses, and so on. And same thing with, with fecal indicator bacteria, determining if it's human, bird, dog, and we're hoping to get great results from that. How long before you have those results and a report on that? We just finished sampling, so analysis is going to take about another year. It's a lot of data to go through. Samantha, did you look at next to the golf course at Key Biscayne where that flat is getting smothered in algae? In Key Biscayne, we looked near Mariner Drive, the Key Biscayne Yacht Club, Key Biscayne Beach Club, and near their Silver Sands Beach Resort. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, over on the bay side, they've got a golf course. And there's a spectacular flat there. The last time my wife and I were over there, it was all the seagrass was in, in, covered with algae. It looked like it was about to go out. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's over. That's just south of Crandon Marina. And okay. it's, right next to a, it's right next to a golf course. And I talked to the guys at Durham and they said, oh yeah, there's these, un, these water channels that funnel water directly from the golf course right into the flat. And golf courses are another one that were cut out of the fertilizer ordinance. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. It's the most intensively managed crop. Yes, it is. All right, guys. Well, any other questions? I have one more question. Yes. Uh, you didn't mention anything about Miami International Airport, which dumps gasoline into the water system, and Turkey Point, which puts heavy metals into the water system. And we've been down at Turkey Point and you can't see any seagrass down there because of the heavy metals and pollution there. Yes, we- So it doesn't have... make sense to regulate a few cities if you've got the major industries dumping like the ag industry and the uh, airport and, and, and 
the seaport and everybody else that's run by the quasi governmental organizations that uh, these are the people that have a lot of money and they should be held responsible. I totally agree. And in this report, we only looked at municipalities. We were not looking at the industrial permit that people need that, not people that companies and whatnot would have to get. But Miami Waterkeeper has done extensive work with FPL and Turkey Point, uh, just winning a, a piece of legislation this past February, where they wanted to get an extension in their license to run the nuclear regulatory facility for another 50 years, which would have it be the longest running nuclear facility in the world. And there are many safety concerns with Turkey Point. And so luckily the Nuclear Regulatory Committee did not grant this license extension. And through this litigation, other nuclear facilities in the country will also be affected where they might not be warranted their extension. But it was absolutely crazy. They were going based off of an environmental impact statement from the 90s rather than using a new one. And also they hire people like Dr. Jerry Alt to uh, to defend their their polluting practices when um, when local groups brought a lawsuit, you know, including the fishing guides, by the way, who were, who were party to that loss to that lawsuit. And um, FPL fought it tooth and nail and they essentially outspent the good guys and got, and, you know, and the administrative law judges never want to take on FPL anyhow, uh, because they, you know, FPL is politically connected. So, um, so, you know, we lost that one. Um, so they were allowed to continue, um, you know, pushing, pushing phosphate out into the bay. And they got all that phosphate into the cooling canals when they operated the plant and made it hotter, basically cooked every, all the life in there, including a huge amount of vegetative matter. And then what they've been doing is they've been adding fresh water and flushing the canals out into the bay through the porous rock. And so, you know, they're effectively cleaning up their mess by pumping it into the bay. And so that's the reason it's not heavy metals. It's the, it's all that phosphate that uh, they've been pushing out underneath and it pops up here and there and it's a little bit unpredictable. So it's hard to, it's hard to go out any time of the year and measure it, but there's times of the year when that water flows particularly. Um, and Dr. Forker at FIU is, is uh, quite convinced that, um, that their data will ultimately show that, uh, that FPL has been, been pushing too much phosphate out there and, and polluting the waters, killing the seagrass. That's Dr. Forkman. Yes. Working with working with Laura Reynolds. Like big sugar, they spend their money on politicians. Okay. Well. Thank you, Samantha. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you all Bring for having us up to speed. And, uh, uh, you know, Thank you. if you'd like, I'll put you on our email list and uh, you can say, you know, stay involved and see that some of the things we do, we do a lot of fishing and, and uh, a lot of environmental stuff as well, you know. I would love to join your list and learn more about what you do. Yeah, truly. Well, I, well, I'll put you on that and Philip as well. Yeah. You know, yeah, stick I'm me on stoddard at fiu.edu. Yeah, well, I'm also at FIU, so I'll look you up anyway. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. If anyone does have any follow-up questions or, or anything that about what Miami Waterkeeper does, uh, just feel free to reach out to me. It's just Samantha at MiamiWaterkeeper.org. Waterkeeper, okay. not Waterkeeper with an S. Just Correct. <laughs> one Waterkeeper. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation tonight. We'll be, we'll be in touch. Thank you. That yeah, was a great job, Samantha. Thank you. And for all the hard work, boy, you guys did an amazing job at that report. I was just, I, I sent it to my whole city commission. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Pointed out, I, I pointed out exactly where South Miami was on this. Cause like we ought to be up at the very top head of, Definitely, you know. Definitely, I agree. No. All right, bye everyone. Thank you again. Okay guys. Thanks. All right.